Friends, welcome to the Ransom Heart Podcast and a very special series that we have for you. A series on the sacred romance, but the unique offering we have, we went down in the basement and we found some audio cassette tapes that are recordings that Brent Curtis and I did back in 1997 when we were beginning to write and teach and speak on what would become the book, The Sacred Romance. I think most of you know the story that Brent and I had a counseling practice together. We were best friends. It was kind of a Jonathan and David story. We had a dream of a ministry that would become Ransomed Heart. It did not exist at the time. And the very first weekend that we held our very first men's event that would become Wild at Heart, Brent was killed in a climbing accident. And that story and that journey is told in other places, including the book, The Journey of Desire, now just titled Desire. But I know that many of you know Brent's name. I know that many of you have loved his writing in The Sacred Romance, but have never heard his voice, never heard his teaching. And so this, I think, is going to be a real treat for all of us. We're going to play here as a 10-part series the talks that we gave around the sacred romance. And so in session one is Brent Curtis speaking on the lost life of the heart. John and I started speaking together. We did have our name hyphenated, so my name is Brent Curtis Eldridge to (laughs) clear up that confusion. John and I are here to tell you a love story, the greatest love story that we think that's ever been written which is still in the process of being written. It's a story in which all of us here have a major part. It's a romance in the classical sense of the word, with heroes and villains and a high-stakes battle between good and evil with everything on the line. And at the center of our story is God as the hero and the beloved those people whose hearts God is out to win. As we all know, any love story revolves around the hearts of the lovers. When we read a love story, the questions that we'd like to have answered are the ones that go like this. What was it about her that drew his pursuit? How did he win her? When did she know she loved him too? And perhaps most importantly, what is it that will sustain and deepen their love in the years ahead. Love stories are very familiar to us all, aren't they? Our culture just immerses us in them from every day, from the movies and televisions uh, that we, uh, shows that we see, to the songs we listen to on the radio, to many of the books we read. The themes are very familiar in the love stories we all know. Boy looking for girl, or at least something that a girl represents. Boy finding girl boy losing girl, and in the case of country and western music, boy singing, if only I'd known I'd had the perfect girl, I wouldn't be playing this jukebox all alone. I kind of grew up on a ranch in northern Idaho, so country and western music is part of my heritage, and I love the way they have analyzed in word and song every aspect of man-woman love. I mean, some of the titles and lyrics are just wonderful. I think one of my favorites is the one that goes, been so miserable without you, it's just like you were here. <laughs> That's country and Western music at its best. Since at least the time of the Romantic poets, Byron, Shelley, Keats, Romantic love has captivated the soul of Western culture in just so many ways. And yet, everyone, for all the airtime and the big and small screen time and the best selling novels like Danielle Steele and daytime soap operas, the life of the heart which is to say that part of us which finds its expression through the deepest levels of our desire is experienced by most of us mainly through the mass media. And the love stories that come from our pop culture hardly ever deal with that last question that every true love story must weave into the plot, the one that asks, what is it that will sustain and deepen this love affair 
as the years go on. When we look more closely, we find that the life of the heart and everything that flows from it, true intimacy, sacrificial love, real purpose in life, is becoming more and more an endangered species in our culture and even in our churches, which are often more an expression of that culture than they are anything else. With one out of two marriages ending in divorce, and of course, most of you know that's Christian marriages as well as non-Christians, many more couples simply going on in resigned disappointment. The failure of romantic love is a clear reality. It is, John and I would like to propose, a loss of heart that most deeply describes most men and women of our day. It's not just the divorce rate and the broken families or even the addictions, both illegitimate and respectable, or the depression that some 20 to 30 percent of Americans reportedly struggle with. Those are heartbreaking enough. But it's also the busyness and drivenness that at first glance look like significant things going on. The fact that most of us are living just to survive, to make it through another week. Blockbuster Video is the cathedral of the 1990s, the place where the average American family falls into on a Friday evening, hoping to find a story to, if not worship, at least help them escape for a while the, the weariness, the busyness of the week, sometimes the lack of meaning. Underneath all of the drivenness and busyness that so many of us feel is often a deadness or a restlessness, if we stop just for a moment, everyone, a voice from somewhere inside sometimes tells us how weary and vulnerable and just plain bored we often are. This voice that speaks to us, often early in the morning before our internal editor has gone on duty, sometimes in the middle of the night, sometimes driving in traffic, this voice tells us not the way things ought to be, or even the way we wish they were, but just simply the way things are. This voice that speaks to us is the voice of our heart, which is to say the deepest part of what I call me. That part of me that will still exist long after my body and my personality, which is in part a product of the fall, and even my memory from the earth have long ceased to exist. That me will still be there. If we stop and listen to that voice, we have a sense that there's an inner story going on in our hearts that has a total disregard for the more visible everyday lives we find ourselves living. The life of raising kids, paying mortgages, career success, organized religion, paying bills, and just simply growing older. This inner story, which we often are aware of most early in the morning, has its own plot lines of passion and fear, doesn't it? Its own joys, its own dreams, its own fantasies, sometimes its own lusts. And again, it tells us it's not the way things ought to be that matter. It speaks to us about the way things are, what we really feel inside. It's a plot line that we often avoid until we really need our heart for true intimacy or true courage or true worship. Think about life's most important moments with me for just a moment. My story, the smaller story that I've tried to live in due to a lot of my background, is kind of the heroic cowboy riding off into the sunset. Once when I was about 16, I went to a school in northern Idaho called Immaculate Heart of Mary Academy. While other boys were learning to dance and talk to girls and how all that kind of stuff worked in the summer. I was out on the ranch working cattle, horses. I loved it. One day a carload of kids went by that I knew from school and I just happened to be riding my horse out back, shaking out a rope, ready to try and lasso a steer that I was going to give some medicine. They saw that and they thought, wow, Brent is a real cowboy. This is pretty neat. And I kind of latched on to that. And since I didn't know how to dance or really talk to girls very well or any of that, my image became about kind of the cowboy that stays at a distance, but he's kind of heroic. And in that place, I didn't need my heart for much. In fact, the first time I really missed it was when I asked a girl to marry me. We had gone out to, uh, I thought, a romantic walk along the beach. The New Jersey, where I lived at the time, has barrier islands. 
I thought we'd go out in the middle of the winter, walk along the beach, it'd be very romantic. We got out there, the wind was blowing so hard, the sand was blowing in our faces. We had to walk immediately in off the beach, try to find a restaurant, everything was closed. About that time I noticed my gas gauge was on empty, my old Ford van ran out of gas in a gas station, which was also closed, so there we were waiting until morning with nothing to do. That being the case, I thought I might as well ask this girl to marry me, so I did. And things went fairly well until we started getting toward the wedding and this anxiety that felt like a block of concrete inside began to grow, it got worse and worse. I began to express my doubts, my ambivalence. Finally, my by then fiance told me to figure out what was going on in my heart. And she went to the shore with my mother for a whole day. Bold girl she was. I sat by the shore for five hours of a lake by our house, trying to figure out what was going on in my heart that felt so afraid, so anxious. At the end of that time, I had no more thought about it than I had at the beginning. I could not find the words to put meaning to what was going on to this place in my heart. I ended up breaking my engagement in a very painful way, going back to aloneness. Times of intimacy are hearts required. Times of true courage. Some of you heard the music from the Titanic. Is there anyone that has not seen the Titanic here? Some of you. Well, you did know it's about a ship sinking, so I won't spoil that part of the plot. But one way of looking at the Titanic is that the passengers on the ship are all caught up in outer stories that suffice as long as nothing unusual happens. Outer stories that have to do with money, that has to do with a certain lifestyle because of the class of society they lived in, with being employees for the ship line. And as the great ship begins to sink and it dawns on everybody, their small story is about to be burst wide open and they are to face death and eternity it's very interesting who finds courage to operate out of a larger story. One great picture on the, in the movie is the ship's orchestra that, as many of you know, played until the very last moment. Even though no one was listening, even though people were rushing madly all around, diving off the ship, falling into lifeboats, falling into the ocean, they played until the last minute with the thought that their music might encourage some. They found courage in their heart in a time they needed it. Or just even think about worship, everyone. Sitting in the church, do you ever just want to sit there wanting so badly to participate, to commune with God, but something in your heart would just rather look out the window at the mountains? It just won't cooperate. Life's most important moments truly require us to have heart. Proverbs tells us, above all else, Guard closely the wellspring of your heart, for from it flow the very waters of life. At life's most important moments, it's the inner story going on in our hearts that dictates how we'll engage or disengage from everything that really matters. When a deadness sets in that we just can't seem to shake, we confess, my heart's just not in it. Scripture shines a powerful light on the heart with over 800 references about the heart in the Old and the New Testaments. The psalmist tells us that the law of God is written where? On our hearts. And that he knows the secrets of our hearts. God laments in Isaiah that his people were worshiping him with their lips, but that their hearts were far, far from him. And Paul adds in Romans 10 that it's with our hearts that we really believe. Oswald Chambers, who many of you know, wrote several devotionals, writes, it's by the heart that we know God and not by our reason. So that's what faith is, God perceived in our hearts. And if someone should ask, but isn't obedience the thing that really matters? We can only answer that question with another, with or without your heart. From the wellspring of our heart flows all true caring, all meaningful work, all genuine worship, and all true sacrifice. Indeed, our faith and the life of hope and love that come from it all issue from this fount deep in our heart as well, because it's in our heart that we first come to hear the voice of God, and it's in our heart that we eventually 
come to really know him and learn to live in his love. Remember the story of Samuel and Eli? Samuel was a young boy, had been dedicated to the temple by his mother, Hannah. He was asleep one night, heard a voice calling, went to Samuel and said, what do you want? Eli was his mentor, hadn't called him. Samuel went back and heard the voice again, went back to Eli, said, what do you want? Eli said, it wasn't me. I don't know who the voice is. Go back to bed. The third time, even Eli, who had been a spiritual mentor for years, finally recognized God's voice speaking to Samuel's heart. And he said, it is the Lord. Go back and do whatever he tells you. John and I, about two months ago, you know, we'd had a little success with a book and a few people had really said it had meant something to them and the lecture series had really stirred some people in some good ways. So we began to think to ourselves, what do we do? Should we make up some brochures, do some publicity, take out an ad on television? Shall we begin to write another book? Maybe we should, uh, you know, begin to do some of those kinds of things. We went to do a little retreat to ask God what we should do. And as we sat in this little ranch house up in the collegiates, I said to John, well, how should we know what God wants? And he said, a brilliant thought, why don't we ask? And I thought, wow, good idea. But I also felt afraid. Do you know why? Because I was afraid when we asked, he wouldn't speak to us. So we asked. Lord Jesus, what do you want us to do in our partnership, in our future? And we just sat in silence together. After about 15 minutes, I shared with some things that were just going on in my heart about how little I had ever orchestrated in my Christian life, and that seemed to be what God was saying to me. John said, that's amazing. That's exactly what I'm sitting here thinking. God wants to speak to us through the voice in our heart much, much more than we think. The most important ways he ever speaks to us, whether that's through the scripture, whether that's through our prayers, the counsel of a friend, or simply through the events of life, is through our hearts. Our heart is the key to the Christian life. But sadly, everyone, most of us pay more attention to the oil level in our car than we do to what goes on in our hearts. The life of the heart like any other life form, requires a certain kind of habitat to survive. Habitat that includes solitude, silence, a sacred space for reflection and meditation. Habitat that our culture has almost totally destroyed. We go from our work to our cell phone to our home computer, and then just in case any open space might be left, we kill that off with the radio, TV, and the newspaper. We might remember that the world system is one of the three enemies cast against us and the life of our heart in this story that we're all living in. The other two enemies being the flesh and the devil. Our culture, everyone, is more and more a product of that system all the time. At a more personal level, too, very early on, most of us have learned to ignore and distrust what our hearts tell us We've learned, it seems, something else is wanted from us other than who we most deeply are. Life teaches us, for the most part, to suppress the deep longings of our hearts and to craft an external performance the world does seem to want. Our parents and peers at school and at work and even sometimes our spiritual mentors have taught us it's something else that's wanted from us other than whatever goes on in our hearts which is to say, that which is most deeply us. So the beautiful are wanted for their looks and the intelligent for their brains and the wealthy for their wealth. Well, take just a moment, everyone. Most of us can remember a time when life offered us a script that seemed a little more attractive than the one going on in our heart. As I mentioned, I grew up in northern Idaho in the late 60s. I was part of the ranch culture up there. My dad was the foreman of a large cattle ranch, my stepdad. What was going on with me at that time, at the age of 12, was trying to find the respect, the love, and the admiration to enter into the world of men. I had kind of gone through a little bit of a story already that very much affected that. My family had broken up twice. I'd never heard from my first dad since we had left. My second dad, 
Count was a very kind man, played the accordion, the piano, smoked a pipe, hummed all the time, hated conflict, uh, would always walk out of the house when any of us would get upset. He left. So this was my second stepdad, a cowboy in the true sense of the word. And we lived right up the road from uh, another rancher by the name of Gordon Egger, tough man. Had a big scar across his nose that he'd gotten in a fight somewhere when he was younger. Wore high-heeled work boots. The kind of guy that when you wrestled with him, you know how when you're 12 you want to test yourself a little bit against the man's world? Just muscles of steel. He would put me on the ground so fast. His way of hunting deer was to get one running down the road in front of his pickup truck and try and run over it. I was with him one night when he tried to do that. A man I admired greatly with all of these kinds of skills. Well, <laughs> one day we were uh, loading hay trucks, hauling hay from a local town, stepdad and myself and Gordon. We worked all day, big bales, maybe about 90 pounds. That's probably about what I weighed back then. And I remember sitting in a bar while Gordon and my stepdad had a beer. And I was in there with them, which is pretty cool stuff for me. And Gordon said to my stepdad, this kid can do the work of any two men I know. And I thought, oh, maybe there's a line I can add to my script. Maybe that's who I can be. Somebody that can do the work of any two men that this man I admire knows. Three years later, with my family about to break up again for the third time, my stepdad and I were out in eastern Washington with a bunch of other ranchers, kind of in the lava country there, if any of you have been in that part of Washington, very volcanic soil, yellow, stubby grass. Brought in cattle from all over, had them in a corral, we're trying to load them on trucks. What was really going on in my inner story, the story of my heart, was a sickness, a depression, I knew that we weren't going to be together that much longer. But one of the cows turned back and would not go up the chute. And five or six times, several of the cowboys couldn't get her to go. Finally, I just stepped in front of her and I said to myself, you're going up the chute. I don't care what you do. I'm not moving. She stopped and looked at me, fortunately for me, turned around and walked up the chute. Now I think God probably had one of his angels assigned to that job. But I heard one of the cowboys say from over on the side of the corral, this kid's cool in a crisis. And I thought, oh, maybe that's somebody I can be too. Cool in a crisis. A guy that can do the work of two men. Do you feel my script beginning to bring itself together in some way that would allow me to enter the world of men? Back then, of course, the movies were all John Wayne, Jimmy Stewart, you know, Henry Fonda, Glenn Ford, those were all my idols. You know, the thing I noticed about those guys, they never had to hold a conversation and they always got the women. <laughs> Do you ever notice the like, high school kids out on a prom date, you know, when the boys are there all dressed up and the girls look so beautiful, the boys all look about 14, the girls look about 29. Well, there's that point where the girls all get up and go to the restroom and the guys are going, oh, thank God, man. We don't have to come up with anything to say for the next five minutes. Well, I never knew that. See, I just watched Jimmy and John Wayne and those guys, and all they had to do is kind of stand and, and look heroic. And women flocked towards them. And I thought, that's part of who I can be, too. Later, I added Clint Eastwood. Remember the spaghetti westerns? Kind of those lines of, so what you've got to ask yourself, punk, is do you feel lucky? Well, do you? I could say those kind of things, use that bluff, kind of high school a couple times. Think for a moment, everyone, of where you got the lines from your script. Here and there, bits and pieces of lines that seemed to make you a little more desirable than the person that you started out to be. At a very third level, any of us who are married or in any kind of close relationship know how hard it is to live out of the life of the heart. Think of a husband who comes home from work, sits down at the meal in angry silence, a definite message being given to his wife. What he's really thinking in his heart is, I reached over to make love to you last night and you rejected me and now you will pay. What goes on in his outer story is angry silence. His wife, reading the silence, also has a story going on in her heart 
But what she does is make his favorite dessert and treat him in every way as well as possible. The story in her heart is, you hadn't spoken to me for a week, and last night you wanted to have sex? My heart wasn't there. But instead of saying those things, she literally tries to redeem the fall by baking chocolate chip cookies. Those are the ways that we fail to live in the life of the heart, everyone, all the time. Gradually and surely, life has taught us all, to one extent or another, to offer the parts of ourselves that are approved. And we live out a carefully crafted performance to gain acceptance from the people that are most important to us. We begin to divorce ourselves from our heart and live a double life. Frederick Beekner says this, our original shimmering self gets buried so deep we hardly live out of it at all. Rather, we learn to live out of all the other selves which we're constantly putting on and taking off like coats and hats against the world's weather. When we're wearing all those coats and hats of our outer story, everyone, we don't have much time or energy to ask ourselves about the story going on in our heart, the doubts, the fears, the dreams, the passions. Given the right plan, everything can be managed. Three steps for a successful marriage, five ways to improve your portfolio, seven habits practiced by successful people, 10 transferable concepts for spiritual living. The church unwittingly has often latched on to this idea of sanctification through better management. And it so often helps to bury the very life of the heart that it is called to draw forth. Eugene Peterson has said, part of the reason the modern church has lost its taste for holiness is that it's become engineered. We tell ourselves that holiness comes about by discipline, work, arranging, rules, hints, regulations, technology. Therefore, it's become very boring and claustrophobic. The life of the heart is also in trouble in our churches in a way that it perhaps hasn't been for decades. I was speaking to the, a wife on a church staff further down the front range about two weeks ago, a woman I really respect a lot, a woman with a lot of integrity, lives her life with a lot of courage for her family, her church. I was talking a little bit about an experience I'd had where it felt like Jesus had actually spoken to me in the middle of the night. And she just looked at me and said, gosh, Brent, I think I'm living like a practicing deist. I've kind of given up on the idea that God really wants to commune with us in any deeper way. And to be honest, I think most of the Christians that I know feel the same way. What a sad, awful thought. The heart the battle that we're all in, the battle for the hearts, our own, those we care about, of the entire world, the, the hearts that Christ literally came to give up his life for, doesn't respond to management plans or to systems or principles. Our hearts don't seek efficiency, but rather passion. Art, beauty, poetry, mystery, ecstasy, story. Those are the things that speak to our hearts most deeply. Eugene Peterson said in a recent Mars Hill Review article that the Christian's main ally in the days ahead for the formation of holiness would not be the theologian, but the artist. That's why Jesus so often taught by telling stories. Remember the one day he was telling the story of the sowers of the seed and the disciples hearing this whole story they had been used to the teaching of the Pharisees, which was principles, tips, regulations, laws. Plus, they didn't have a clue what Jesus was talking about in this story about seed sowed in different kinds of ground. And they came up and asked him, Matthew 13, Jesus, why do you teach by telling stories? And what he said is very striking, especially in the message. He said this, you've been given insight and understanding into the kingdom of God, but all of these out there have been hearing it in their heads so long that seeing they have become blind and hearing they have become deaf. I tell stories to ready their hearts towards the kingdom of God. On another day, one of the religious leaders came and he asked Jesus a really wonderful question, or at least it would have been if he'd really wanted to know the answer rather than just testing Jesus. 
He said, teacher, what should I do to obtain real life? And Jesus said, as he often did, answered with another question, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And the religious leader said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you've answered well. Go away and do it and you'll find life. What goes on in your heart when you hear Jesus' words, go away and do it and you'll find life? Joy, lightness of spirit, that's not a problem, Jesus. I can do that. Love God and my neighbor with all my heart, all my mind, my strength. No problem. Most days, I have real struggles with a decision to get out of bed myself. If we listen to our hearts when the weight of the law speaks to us, what our hearts say is a very different story. Sometimes a weariness, sometimes a sense of that's too hard, I'll never get there. As that religious teacher went away saying, okay, I can do that, there must have been a, a sadness in Jesus at the thought that he had missed the point entirely. He had listened with his head and not his heart. In fact, Paul tells us that the law is just a schoolmaster to lead us and take our hand and put it in the hand of Christ. And after that, it's done its job. After it teaches us that we really can't live up to it, and our heart knows that very well, doesn't it? And yet as Christians, we don't listen to our hearts much more efficiently or attentively than anyone else. Along with all the other coats and hats that we try to wear, we also don the Christian religious cloak so many times. The one that seems everyone else is wearing in church was such great success. They look happy. They look like they're doing well. Sometimes, after our first love experience has ebbed away, though, everyone in that whirlwind of Christian activity and business, don't we all begin to lose some of our passion? Have you experienced that somewhere in your Christian journey? Our faith somewhere along the trail begins to feel more like a series of problems that have to be solved or principles that have to be mastered before we're ever going to find that abundant life that Jesus promised us so long ago. We rarely ask ourselves if we can really do or even should be doing all the activity that we're bringing together in this outer story we're trying to contain our spiritual life in. Remember that Jesus' invitation to us was, come to me if you know you are thirsty. If we're not in touch with the longings of our heart, that invitation doesn't really mean a thing. So many times when we feel thirst, when we feel lack of passion, when we feel just weary with the road, what we do is ignore those things that our heart's telling us, and instead we move our spiritual life to the outer story of activity. We join another Bible study. We take on teaching a Sunday school class. We enroll in a discipleship course. Uh, we volunteer to usher every other Sunday. If we're evangelical, we even try to go to more potluck dinners, those strange phenomenon that are among us. We step up our activity at the very time our heart is saying, I'm staggering under the load. To get rid of our heart, we often just lock it in the attic somewhere, feed it the bread and water of duty and discipline till it's almost dead. Or we give it a life on the side somewhere, a hobby, soon begins to feel like an addiction, and we keep that over here and do our spiritual life on Sunday mornings. What we want to say this weekend, everyone, is that our hearts are telling us the truth when it speaks to us in those early morning times, in those quiet times. There really is something missing the story going on in our hearts is the one that God himself put in every one of us before the beginning of time. It is the story of a love affair, and the voice of our heart is the only one that knows how to be in that affair. It's not a story you can live out primarily as principles or ethics or programs. It has to be lived as a love story. It is possible to recover the life of the heart and with it the intimacy and beauty and adventure that we first thought would be there with God when we first started out on the journey. To recover the story, though, it may be necessary for us to take a pilgrimage, one that even leaves behind parts of the religion that we've grown so comfortable with over the years. Frederick Buechner tells us that to take this journey, 
we have to start and listen to our lives. He says this, if God speaks to us at all, other than through such official channels as the Bible and the church, then I think he speaks to us largely through what happens to us. And if we keep our hearts and minds open as well as our ears, if we listen with patience and hope, if we remember it all deeply and honestly, then I think we'll come to recognize beyond all doubt that however faintly we may hear him, he is indeed speaking to us, and that however little we may understand of it, his word to each of us is both recoverable and precious beyond telling. Think back to the first things that ever spoke to your hearts, everyone, as young children. What were they? Remember Jesus said, to really live in the kingdom of God or even enter it, you have to come in as a little child. If we remember back, the first things that most of us remember were a kind of enchantment, a kind of wonderfulness that we lived out in the stories that we all, the games, the children's games and books and times that were there every day. It was a story that seemed to exist on its own and just let us borrow from it. It had heroes, it had villains, it had suspense, and a sense that everything would end well. Everything would end well. And we borrowed from that story as we played our childhood games, didn't we? That's one of the things that used to be in our hearts as children. There was another thing there, too, if many of us will think about it. Sometimes it hit us again early in the morning, the middle of the night. Sometimes as we heard our parents fighting through the bedroom wall, a kind of anxiety, a kind of dread, a kind of something that said things are not all right. You had better be careful. You had better keep your heart protected. Those two revelations spoke to all of us in just the everyday things that happened to us. The story of a great romance, something wonderful wooed us. And the story of something darker just in the background but maybe the romance is the more powerful of the two, so think with me there for a moment. Each of us usually has a geography where the romance first spoke to us. It's usually the place we both long to visit again and are afraid to go back to for fear it won't be the same. When I was very young, up until about eight, a farm, 120 acres in New Jersey, on the edge of the farm was a creek that to me held all the mystery in the world. And sometimes at the end of the day, just past when all the work was done, just as the moon was coming out, I'd walk down through the cornfield, come out into this little grass meadow in the moonlight, and walk ahead into where a line of trees guarded this creek that was the border of our farm. I'd go down to the creek and sit on a sandbar. In New Jersey, when you sit in the sand, it bleeds red because there's so much iron ore in it. And I would squat down on my heels in that place and if you've ever been in the east in the summer, the sound of insect life is a deafening chorus. I would sit down there by that dark water, listening to the sounds of crickets and katydids, cicadas. It just seemed to be a chorus that swelled with life. And right next to me, there was a bridge where the road went across the creek. Under the bridge was a little pond that had bullfrogs, and you could hear them doing whoop, whoop bass notes to the whole affair. There was something that would happen to me in that place. I would fill up with life so deeply, and I would come home and go to bed and just remember laying in my bed feeling so alive, not being able to wait to get up the next day to weave out my cowboy stories. I always wore two guns, not just one. I always had a wooden sword that killed dragons. It killed hundreds of dragons. But that was the kind of story, the adventure, the mystery, the life that somehow I borrowed from as a kid. You know what I'm talking about. You had your version of it. Your geography might be a little different than mine. For some of us, it was a childhood play area. For others, it was um, a sunroom or an attic or a garden. The rest of us, maybe a childhood book, a vacation spot our family went to in the summer, or sitting on a grandfather's lap, listening to a favorite story over and over. Those are the things that when we think about it first captured our hearts when we were young. 
Annie Dillard said, we wake, if ever we wake at all, to mystery. The part that that story invites us all to play is a little different between men and women, isn't it? For boys, the part we played out usually came in the form of an adventure that required something of us. We did it in front of girls, but they were, back then at least, kind of unimportant. It always had to do with a mission, a quest, a battle, kind of bound together with others of like mind and spirit. That is the story that we rehearsed as boys, isn't it? And you've all heard the story. Back in the 70s, there was a kind of a thing to make everyone androgynous. If you treated boy and girl children the same, they grew up the same. Then boy children kept doing annoying things like making guns out of their breakfast toast and having wars with their dolls where they would tear the heads off. There is something different in the way that a boy rehearses the story from a girl. But there is something in the heart of a man that has to do with the mission, the quest, the hunt, bound together with others of like mind and spirit. My old partner used to do a survey of the top five things that men wanted in women, and it usually always came out this same way. Surprisingly, it was not what you might think. It was not sex. The number one thing that men would usually say was, we want someone to adventure with us, to ski double black diamonds, to go dancing in the middle of the night, to go to the shore in the middle of the winter and have a romantic walk as you're blasted by the sand in 20 degree weather. <laughs> Deep down, that's what every man wants with a woman, is someone to join him in the quest, the mission, to be part of all of that with him. There's a diary that I read of a, of a Confederate soldier on the way to Gettysburg, and of course they were going there to get shoes. He was worn out, tired, beat from days of marching, uh, had no uh, shoes of his own. And he was writing a letter to his wife talking about how weary and worn out, and yet he said this, as I look at the Army of Northern Virginia stretched out beyond and behind me, I know that I will never again in my life be part of a grand affair as this. Something about the mission, something about being part of something bigger than we are, something that has meaning, something that has purpose. That's the story that's in the heart of every man that God has put there from before the beginning. For women, and again, I have to apologize, this is somewhat presumptuous, I know, except I've been married for 22 years, so this is from my wife, other women that have told me this in counseling. What is it that a woman rehearses in the story? What's her part? And I would, might want to say it like this, ladies, that the part that you rehearse most powerfully is a desire to flesh out that mission or that quest in creative relationship and community. There's a line in uh, Lonesome Dove. Remember Robert Duvall, the miniseries out a while ago? And he makes the comment that we all forget how raggedy-ass the West really was before the ladies got here. I was reading a book not too long ago called Further West Than Everything, and the author said the best that men could do, even in times like there was a funeral when one of their friends would die, the best they could come up with as far as meaning is to stand around the grave and say things like, he was good with horses, wasn't he? <laughs> That's kind of the life of the heart that sometimes men live without a woman's eyes, without a woman's heart. There's something about a woman who has eyes to see the relational picture and what the quest requires. Survey that my partner used to take, number one thing women wanted, see what this matches up, ladies, with your hearts, is that a man that would listen to my heart and not think it's just sentimentality but meaningful. Remember the old Kathy cartoons, Kathy and Irving, they're always trying to live out their relationship. There's a tendency for men to just think all this communication is so much. If you watch Home Improvement, you know what Tim Taylor thinks. But Kathy and Irving are sitting there on the couch, and in the first panel, Kathy's saying, Irving, you know, we need to talk more. And Irving is just kind of sitting there. Second panel, Kathy says, Irving, the key to every relationship it's communication. It's good talk. Third panel, Irving is saying, does this count as our talk or do I still have to come up with something? There's kind of this thing between men and women that goes on like that about communion. 
But the story is in both men and women's hearts, and it's about the quest. Uh, it's something that captures uh, a woman's heart, Sound of Music, as you remember the story of Captain Von Trapp, his wife had died, and along with it, his heart. And he was kind of engaged again with the thought of just trying to entertain himself through life. And then Maria, the housemaid and the children's nanny, came along and began to restore the life of the heart to his house. If the heart of a man is a certain singularity of purpose, to be part of a mission, a quest that has meaning, the heart of a woman brings life to that quest. In Proverbs 8, it tells us that Lady Wisdom was one of the first of God's creations and that she was with him in everything that he did in all of the creation and that she took delight and believed in both God and all of mankind. The heart of a man, the heart of a woman, bound together in a quest that has meaning, that has purpose, that started before the dawn of time. That is a large part of the story of our hearts. In the words of friends, in all of us is a longing to be in a relationship of heroic proportions. That is a major part of the story in our hearts. Someone or something has romanced us, if we think about it, in spite of everything else that may have been wrong, has romanced us from the very beginning. Sometimes we felt it in a Creekside Singers like I did. Sometimes in pastel sunsets, sometimes in the majesty of the Rockies, when the Alpen glow is there in an evening, more than just the beauty of nature, it is the wooing of a lover when we're in those places. If that were the only thing that our hearts experienced, we would search for it all of our lives. We've all had enough tastes and tantalizing glimpses of the romance, that we would search for it with open hearts. But there is another message that seems to come to us in darker hues and intensities. From the time we were very young, often it seems to come out of nowhere and for no discernible reason that we can fathom. It is dark and full of dread. I call it the message of the arrows. You've been listening to Brent Curtis speaking on the sacred romance from a conference that Brent and I did back in the late 1990s. And we are going to continue this series in the weeks ahead here on the Ransomed Heart Podcast. 